Okay, so welcome back. We are going to continue with session nine, talking some more about energy and daylight and some of the different envelope characteristics of our building. And to do this, what I want to do is actually illustrate another tool to you that I think is actually a very good one because it gives very, very quick feedback and I think a lot of insight about how things are going. It uses the same engine, ultimately, that we are using underneath the other tools, the DOE 2.2 engine. It just displays it to you in another form that I think is actually sort of very useful because I think it's very intuitive to work for with. Yeah, Tawa, what you got? Oh, which is where did you handle the Okay, where I put this is I put that inside session nine. Okay, and see if you can find one called Example Mini Skull Small Skylights. This is one of the daylight examples, but I guess we could also use it for the thermal examples. That's okay. The idea is though that it's a fairly simple example, and whenever I start trying to use a new tool, I always want to go back and see will it work in a very simple case before I put it into uh, my full featured building. So the idea is, let's see if we can get to this, this example, many small skylights. Okay, see if it's under, if you can find it under session nine. I'm pretty sure it's under there. I have many things hanging around under session nine. This says example mini small skylights. I just added it, so you might have to refresh your browser. Okay. But I want to introduce you to this other tool called Sapphire Road, which I think is a really good complement to a lot of the IDS tools because I think it gives you very sort of quick feedback, which lets you start to develop an intuitive understanding. Like, one of the things that I think are a little uh, difficult about, for example, using the daylighting analysis tool in the Autodesk suite is that it gives you the answer you need, but it's kind of oh, a many minute operation waiting for getting some results. So it's a little hard to get very dynamic about experimenting with the windows and the locations of the windows just because you know, it always feels like you send it off and you wait five minutes and it comes back and it feels a little disconnected. In the same way with the energy, we can produce a very fantastic energy report, or with insight, we actually sort of get much better feedback about the things that will make a difference. But Sapphire, I think, adds a little bit to it by showing you a very nice diagram of where the energy goes. And I want to introduce that tool to you so you could have it available in your tool of a, your, your kit of tools. In terms of finding Sapphire, where it exists is, it should be under the add-ins tab. So if you navigate around to Revit on one of these machines, it'll be here. If you don't have it because you're on your own machine and you want to sort of download it, you can, because it all just works on your username. If you say Sapphira Revit download, It's going to be right there. That's the learning path. Let's see if it actually has a link for you there. Please click here. OK, you can download it right there. Okay, if you're putting it on your own machine, if you're on one of these machines, it should be right here. So go to your add-ins tab and see if you find it. Are most people finding it? OK, if you have found it, let's do this. Go ahead and, oh, actually, we do need to go ahead and put this building someplace. I'm not sure if this one that I just put out there has a place yet. So let me say manage, and we'll give it a location. Where am I in this building? Looks like Seattle, Washington. Well, that's, that's a place. That'll work. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, add-ins. We'll choose Sapphira. Let's see if we can open that and make that work. Curtain walls, windows, roofs, and floors. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and sign on in. You should be able to sign in using uh, your credentials. In fact, well, in that email that it sent you, did it have you create a password or something like that? Very good, okay. So go ahead and like log on in and see if you can do that. Uh, what do I have to 
be, I'll try this. Do I exist here? I exist here. Okay. There are several steps to using Sapphira. One thing it's going to do is it's going to take this model that exists out here, this multi-line model, and it's going to create an energy model. Okay, and that's actually very similar to whatever Revit does. It's the same thing. It's going to take all these surfaces that have thermal properties, these windows that have different light properties. It's going to make an energy model. So you can start out by just saying generate Sapphira. What it's going to do is go through and try to analyze for us and just determine really which of those different surfaces are floors, which are windows, which are roofs. Okay. I'm just going to say got it because it's going to go through several different pages. Okay. And it's going to show me a little bit about how it understands the building. The blue surfaces are being windows, the brown is a shading surface, it's kind of a kind of teal ones of the wall, the oranges are the doors, but it's basically broken it down into a series of surfaces. Now, just to sort of contrast that to the Revit energy analysis, this is very parallel to what happens when you say generate an energy model. It's basically the same operation. It's going to say, you've got surfaces, you've got thermal properties, let me reduce them to single surfaces, okay, so I can do the analysis. Okay, next up, we can say analyze the plugin, analyze in the plugin, open in real time, and let's sort of see what it's good for doing. This plugin really has sort of two main features to it. One is daylighting and one is energy analysis. And again, this is all about just sort of getting insight. So there's actually many different tools that are available this way. What I like about this plugin is it goes through and creates what I think of as sort of a very nice diagram to help you understand where the energy is going. So let's go ahead and see if we can figure this out. If we click on, it looks like it's updating right now, gains and losses. Looks like it's still updating right now, so let's give it a chance. What it's going to report for us is all the different surfaces that are either gaining or losing energy. Okay. We can also go back and sort of say how it's doing on the whole notion of uh, daylighting. But it's basically running that same sort of simulation that the energy analysis is doing. It takes those surfaces, it figures out based on the rooms that are in here, you know, just what the use is going to be. Looks like this is actually, it didn't pick up the uh, location being in Seattle, Seattle. We'll see if that picks up when it finishes updating. There you go. I'm going to close it up. Still updating. There we go. So let's take a look at this little diagram oh, that's showing right here. Doesn't pull the location. Didn't pull the location properly. We can go through and like switch it over if you want to. Say that it's going to be in Seattle or something like that. I'm going to leave it there just for the purpose of showing you guys, and you can change yours. It basically has different sort of things that are impacting heating or cooling. So if we look at all of the different sort of choices under here in this diagram, things that are red are things that are sort of impacting the heating, things that are green or, or things on that side are impacting the cooling. For example, if I look at, for example, over here on the cooling side right now, which of those different bars appears to be the biggest of all the different bars that are kind of hanging around over here? What sort of seems to be the biggest impact of things that are on the right hand side? Um, infiltration. Infiltration, that's kind of an interesting one. That's sort of a harder one for us to change. Let's take a look at it. We have this notion of really, is it normal or is it very, very tight? So normal practice 
leaky building all the way down to best practice or an extremely tight building. So we're kind of normal right now. If we want to say that we were going to have a very tight building, so use best practices to really make sure that the minimum amount of air is kind of leaking through the walls and the, or the, and the windows and the doors, we can sort of increase and improve that a little bit better. Let me go back here again. It's updating right now. It's kind of regenerating. Okay. It's done some regenerating. You can see now what is the next best thing or next important thing that's sort of affecting us on the cooling side? Great. So the windows on the south side, they're getting a lot of solar radiation that's affecting cooling. So in terms of thinking about this, we have different styles of windows, different solar heat gain coefficients. We can go through and go from very standard windows to sort of very high performance windows that have a very low solar heat gain, internal blinds, but it'll update itself. And the idea of this thing is that it's really just supposed to be going through and showing you really what is the things that you should be spending the most time on to think about where you can make the biggest impacts. Okay. Looks like that's updating. What's going to happen is after south solar, next we'll go ahead and attack east solar. And finally we get to, oh, at this point it looks like wall conduction is the next thing. So in terms of wall conduction, again, you can go through and choose that. Right now it's assuming sort of poorly insulated walls with an R value of around 9. So I can make it a much better insulated wall. An R21 wall, and again it'll update it. So Sapphira, I don't want to belabor it. It's just a fun tool to play with. This kind of chart I find very, very helpful for just really starting to see where the flows are and understanding what's impacting both the heating and the cooling. But look at the heating side. You know, this whole wall conduction actually that should actually improve both of them because that's going to improve both the heating and the cooling performance. Okay, so this notion of going through and getting some energy information is very, very useful. Notice also just this notion of the EUI, this dropping tool, but now it's down to 23. So you can see that wall. Now I'm back to South Solar again. So it's, it's all a delicate balancing act to figure out where to spend uh, the attention. Okay, the other type of visualization that I think is very real useful within Sapphire is called the daylighting visualization. Let's take a look at that. So if you open the daylighting visualization, Okay. That's basically the way it's looking at this building right now, where there's a number of different scales it could be using here, different types of analysis it could be using here. In this case, what is it doing? It is looking at the whole notion of, well, what is this one doing? That's not a specific date and time. This is the minimum and maximum. It's basically trying to give us a sense of really whether it's under or over like illuminated. You can sort of see now that, you know, as we are looking at it, the place that really has the least amount of illumination is just right there, kind of in that center hallway. Okay. You can go through and actually get a little context. Context is if you want to see the walls sort of grayed in there. If you want to see the internal walls, you can sort of see the windows in the hallway. You can also see the roofs a little bit. By seeing this, you're starting to see, in this case, we have pretty good daylighting throughout because I put all the little skylights in there, but they're sort of distributing it there. That's actually looking pretty good. Other things you can look at, there's this whole overlit or underlit. That's just another sort of simulation. This is just kind of based on this whole notion of having enough foot candles or too little foot candles. We also have daylighting factor in there too. Let's let it finish running this one. But what I like about Sapphire just as a tool is that it's fairly nice and interactive in that, yeah, if we go through and keep this window open, that's the whole notion of where it's under and overlit. So we're a little overlit out there by the windows. We're sort of right in the middle zone. We're a little dark in the middle there. Okay. If you
you wanted to go through and try changing that, you could. So if we come on back and say that, hey, I want to try just, what if I put some more skylights in there? Zoom on in here. I'll put a few more skylights in. Maybe I'll put some out in the hallway. So I put some down in that end of the hallway. If I say update the visualization, it's going to rerun it. and it'll report back, hopefully, a little bit more data about really where the underlit and the, under, and the overlit areas are. Doing its thing, taking its time. better in the hallway now. I think you can see a little bit of gray showed up in there. Okay, so again, just another tool to help you play. So go ahead, have fun playing around and trying to figure out the right balance of all these different envelope features because it really is a, it's a, it's a delicate balance once you change any aspect of it, all these other aspects changing and it really does operate on the principle of the weakest link. So go through and see if you can figure out where the weakest link or the highest performance place is and as you change that, it'll shift to another location as you're trying to keep everything in balance. But don't just sort of assume that you should just throw a lot of insulation at it or very high performance windows on all sides because that might be spending money that isn't actually benefiting you. Okay, enough of all that. I want to shift our attention over here in the last little bit, just thinking about the structure on your buildings. Okay, and structure is sort of a really very big important feature to think about. Actually, how many students are actually structure students? Well, Harrison is. Oh, boy, a bunch of you are. Let me count. Okay, excellent. Got a lot of you in here. Okay, in terms of thinking about structure, you're going to do A-OK -okay in terms of uh, kind of thinking about the overall online form of what you're trying to create and like a, uh, well, hang on. Let me put the, open this up. And I want you to kind of please share with your neighbors who don't have as much experience designing structures. You gotta pull this up again. At a high level, yeah, I like to think about structures in terms of sort of what they're trying to support, just really what type of systems we're trying to go through and create, and then our strategy for going through and doing them. And a big important issue is this notion of really what is the structure's relation to the envelope? Okay, we have different sorts of structural systems. We have, oh, all sorts of uh, different structural systems we put in there. Typically, we're trying to basically address two types of needs, the gravity loads, which are coming on down, trying to keep things from moving on down. So we have a lot of different pieces we're gonna model that are related to that. We also have lateral systems, which are trying to keep things from moving sideways in the event of high winds and in earthquakes and seismic events. So there's a lot of different sort of particular requirements we're gonna start designing. And Really, our mode of operation here is going to be to go through and start designing some different systems and placing some different components that we think will address those different needs, and then doing some analysis to sort of see how well they're doing and resizing things as we go. 
as many people move from just working at it, looking at it as an envelope and an architectural form into more of a structural form, this really sort of important issue comes in of thinking about really how does the structure sort of fit into your envelope? And depending upon the type of construction, you know, the materials you're using and where you're building it and the specific construction techniques, there are a lot of different ways to approach that. So I want to show you some examples just to get you started thinking creatively about that, and then we'll think about what that actually means. So we can go ahead and think about the walls as actually being the structural system. In a lot of cases, the walls are not only providing the building skin, but they're actually providing the structure too. And a lot of small buildings, wood frame houses, smaller structures, the walls are actually providing that structural support as part of what they do. However, in larger buildings, we tend to separate those two functions. We let the skin just really take care of the building envelope, the thermal, and the daylighting properties, things like that. We let the structure stand alone. And when the structure is standing alone, we have all sorts of different approaches. So at a high level, you can think about lots of different buildings where the structure is there, but it's actually inside the skin. So in most of the buildings we sort of see, you know, the tall skyscrapers and the ones we sort of think about that are kind of the ones you iconically uh, recognize around the world, often the structure is hiding inside the building. So for example, in Shanghai, the beautiful tower there, you have the older one, here with a One World Trade Center, like that. Again, they have a smooth, sheer facade, and the structure's there, it's just sort of hiding inside. Okay. Even over here uh, at the Clark Center here on campus, you, know, you have a lot of very interesting stuff, big glass curtain walls floating all over the place. For the most part, the structure's inside. You can even start to see the structure with these columns that are coming down inside the glass. So that's certainly one very valid strategy is to put things inside. Another strategy, which you don't see all that often, okay, or you see probably less commonly, that's the better way to express it, is to put the structure on the outside and actually make the structure very visible and celebrate the structure. So here's a couple examples of buildings that do that. Uh, Taliesin West has got a really cool Frank Lloyd Wright structure down in Arizona. And the big trusses are actually an architectural feature. On the outside of the building, you can see them and it's actually a big piece of the architectural message. In Kansas City, there was an arena called Kemper Arena. Again, you can sort of see the big structural trusses outside of the building, and that was a feature. Over here, this is like the Hong Kong Bank Building. Again, you sort of see this gigantic, it's almost like a big suspension bridge sort of structure with things actually plugged into it. Okay, and that's actually kind of an interesting way to do it. Many older buildings, including many that we have here, have the structure actually in line with the building. So let's kind of show you some of those ones. The Hancock Tower, that's kind of a very interesting building that was built in Chicago. You can sort of see the structural skeleton. It's actually just right at the same place as the facade. It's actually part of the facade. And many of these diagram structures, like the Hearst Building in New York, or St. Mary's Axe, which is in London, you can actually sort of see the structure just really as part of the skin. Even things like we have here on campus at Tresseter Union, when you see all those columns that are sort of buried in the curtain wall and the concrete structure above the curtain wall being right in the middle, it's really just right at the surface. Or if we look at something like uh, the old quad buildings, again, the structure is just really in the surface. Those stacked blocks are actually providing the structural support where they used to be. Nowadays, it's a bit of a fake in that we sort of keep the stacked blocks, but we go through and like I have a concrete structure on the inside with the stacked blocks on the outside to kind of maintain that appearance. But very often we have concrete walls, or even in a typical wood frame house, the structure is just in line with the walls. So the question really becomes, as you think about doing your structures for your building, where is your structure? A, what materials are going to be? Okay, and there's some very strategic thinking to think about whether you're going to have a concrete structure or a steel structure or a wood structure or a combination of all those things. And B, where do the walls and the structural lines sort of sit relative to each other? 
Okay, and that's one of your first things to have to decide. After we get that decided, there's a lot of very detailed modeling we'll get into, but you have to start with an overall strategy about how you want to do that. And maybe the best way to illustrate that is just to come over and kind of, I'll show it in Revit real quickly. And we can think about how that's going to apply to your building. So as we think, I'm just going to create a new project. I'll just stick with the architectural template for now. Okay. You're going to be starting with your own building. And what we're going to do is actually we're going to go through and make a separate model for your structure. We'll do that. We're going to have two different models and link them together. That's kind of a very powerful way of doing it. But I just want to think about this issue where the structural relationship is and the notion of grid lines so that you can then like that start planning ahead for your building over the next couple of days. So many of us have been drawing buildings and we have all sorts of interesting forms going on. We can say that, oh, whether you have kind of like a brick walls like we've been sort of doing in a lot of uh, what I've been working on. Or I have curtain walls. Again, we've been using a lot of those. Let's put some curtain walls down. there gets to be this question of really where is the structure going to be? And at a high level, let's look at it this way. If we think about the structure as actually being the dominant part and the skin actually building something that just responds to and relates itself smartly to the structure, okay, you actually start to understand a good relationship that we typically have. Because in most buildings, we don't build the skin first. We usually build the structure first and then relate everything relative to where the structure is. So let's talk about some different ways of doing that. One way would be to go through and if we had these walls, for example, I'll use this curtain wall over here and this wall over here, this sort of a brick wall over there. We could go ahead and put the structure on the inside of the walls. And that's actually a very common thing. Again, if you want to sort of hide the structure and have the skin sort of wrap around the outside, we often go through and we'll put the, curtain or the, the structure inside. So how we do that is we'll say, let's go through and I'll grab a grid. As we're working with structure, we almost always work with grids and put things on grids because it helps us organize and label everything. So I could put a grid here right here. I'll put another grid line over here. In the opposite direction, I'll put a grid line up here. I'm going to give that one a slightly different designation though. I'm going to call it grid A. I'm going to put another grid in next to it over here. Let that be grid B. Okay. So in the way I've drawn this here, it looks like I'm going to start putting my structure inside of that. Okay. So as I do that, I can. I can go through and say, hey, I'm going to put some structural columns in here. I'm going to not worry about the specifics right now. We can make this out of steel or concrete. We'll look at it both different ways, but I'm just going to put a steel one in here right now. I'm going to put it so it goes up to level two. But a very common thing is to go through and just drop them right on the grid lines. The nice thing about dropping columns right on the grid lines is they understand themselves as being hosted by those grid lines. So for example, if you move the grid lines, the structure moves with it. So that's actually pretty handy. Okay. So we can look at it in 3D here. We'll go ahead and just bring those all down. Once we've put those basic kind of columns in there, 
we can start joining them together. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through and say that, hey, in the same sense we put those in there, we're going to start putting some beams in there. I'm going to let them snap to 3D and pull them across from here to here. And I'll pull that across in the other direction too. The idea is though, if you like dealing with tinker toys and you like putting together little sort of models where lots of little pieces come together, you know, this type of modeling is very appealing. There could be a lot of tricks we're gonna sort of learn to use here, but at some level, we're just sort of putting together all the little sticks and making the right thing happen. So in this sort of scenario where the structure is on the inside, what tends to happen is the exterior surface, okay, is hanging on the outside. We'll think about really what the relationship is in terms of how we would exactly like that wall to hug up to the grid lines. But we're really gonna think about the grid lines as being the dominant element. And we'll typically give them nice dimensions. They'll be 20 feet apart, 25 feet apart. They'll be sort of nice, even increments. So as we're going through this exercise, I just want you to be ready for the notion that as we start putting your structural grid in, your walls may move around a little bit to accommodate it, and that's okay. Just sort of expect that. So don't get too locked into every last you know, inch where the wall is, because usually what's going to happen is they're going to respond to the structure and have a relationship to wherever the structure ends up. So if, for example, over here, That ended up being not 37.6 or something like that, but that actually ended up being 36 feet because that was a reasonable dimension. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and have things move relative to it. Okay, we can go through and keep structure on the inside like that. Another thing we is perfectly valid as a strategy to do though is to sort of pull the structure to the outside. And that works A-OK -okay too. If we do expose it on the outside, we tend to go through and put a little bit of a covering on it so it's not looking like a bunch of raw exposed steel. But as you're leaving the Y2E2 building today, I want you to look up towards the roof and notice those gigantic orange columns which are sort of holding up the big roof overhangs. So we have sort of a combination of inside and outside structure here. For the most part, as you look at the Y2E2 building, do you see the structure from the outside? Not very much. Okay, it's primarily a structure inside building where all the stone panels are sort of attached to the floor on the outside. Okay, but there are a few cases where those giant orange columns come up and support the roof, where there it's very visible, like that. So it's kind of a combination of both. But what we're going to try and do is, in your buildings, where for all their organic, twisty, unusual forms. We're going to try and come up with a basic grid system that we can then use to organize the structure and then start building a structural model on that. Okay. So just thinking ahead, be thinking about do you want to see your structure or do you want to hide your structure? Okay, and yeah, based on that, and also be thinking about the whole issue, are you sort of a steel person, a concrete person, a wood person? And part of this can depend on where you're planning to build your building. Because in different parts of the world, you should try to build using the context of the materials that are local and the construction industry understands there. Okay. But come in with ideas like that, and then on Wednesday, we'll go through and basically build the structure as someone's building together. Okay? As a separate model that's linked in. Yeah, tell uh, What's a good, good uh, separation between columns? Like it's, um, it depends on just the size of the depth of the beams that you're going to have between them. Yeah. Like anything less than 20 feet is like, that's that, no problem at all. That's, you know, we could do that with very, very small members. If it's getting up to around 30 feet, then, you know, the beams are getting a little deeper usually. Depending on the load, they might be getting up to 18 inches or 20 inches, something like that. If it's much longer than 40 feet, you're looking at very deep sort of things like trusses and elements that are really able to support long spans. So in general, if you're sort of between like 20 and 30 feet, you're in good shape. Okay. Almost anything is engineerable as necessary, but yeah, there's a cost to it. So uh, go ahead and yeah, see if you can come up with a reasonable spacing. But at the same time, don't make a forest of columns <laughs> because part of what you're trying to do is have a nice big open exhibit space. So some of those spaces might be 40 by 40. So if you end up with a spacing of like that, that's okay. 
It just means we have to put some uh, taller beams in there to go through and support that. Okay? Okay. Let us go ahead and adjourn for today. Again, the idea is just think about your building where that structure might be. We've got to look at that together on Wednesday because everyone's building's a little bit different and yields itself just a little separately. So we'll have different advice for everyone depending on the specifics of what they're trying to achieve. Okay, great. Let us go ahead and break.